It's a little after 2.30, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so thank you everybody who is here in person. Thank you everybody who is on Zoom. And today we are welcoming Dr. Tyler Moore, um, who works at Bellevue University, and he is going to talk about plant communities for ecosystem health. Um, and I will think I think I'll let him give just a short introduction to himself because he knows himself better <laughs> than anybody else here. Um, and then we'll go ahead and get started with his presentation. Um, so for people in the room, if you could give a round of applause to Dr. Moore. <laughs> and I'll let you take it away. Yes, it's great to see so many people here um, and then online as well. Uh, so I'm at Bellevue University. Um, so we, I think, got connected originally through TriFate through some research projects that John Kent was doing up here and he and I were kind of working together on some of those. And so today I'm going to talk a little bit about the plant side of things. I know he was very bacterial and we might lean a little bit into bacteria towards the end too. And we'll see. I mean, it, we can be as sciencey or as non-sciencey as we feel like. So I'll keep it, <laughs> keep it fluid. If, if it's feeling not very sciencey, I can knock it up a notch, but it, you know, we can, we can keep it as is if we want to. So feel free to let me know if you have any questions and, and we'll, uh, we'll try to learn something. So, our, all right. so I wanted to point out that the environment really, this environment, quote unquote, um, needs us less than we need it, you know? So everything that we need for survival really comes from the world. The world is a closed system. So the water that we're drinking, the food that we're eating, it's all coming from earth. So our food source, our healthy air source, all of this is coming from earth. So we really need the environment. And these features that come from the environment that are providing benefits to us, we generally call those ecosystem services. Because these are things that a healthy ecosystem are going to provide for humans. Um, and we get these benefits from them. So these are kind of those general categories of what people generally consider ecosystem services. So provisioning, so this would be like material goods, maybe it's food, maybe it's lumber, um, water. There's supporting services. So this is you know creating biodiversity with a healthy ecosystem. Um, this would be things like, you know, creating more plants because we're pollinating the flowers that are out there. Uh, we have regulating services that are just keeping the whole earth habitable. So carbon sequestration would be one thing. So uh, reducing the effects of uh, climate change, purifying the air, purifying the water, um, making it so all the water doesn't rush into the rivers at one time when it rains. So this is uh, mitigation of floods. You know, and then cultural services, which I kind of want to focus on today because, you know, what better we're at the Tri-Faith Institute. And so um, the idea of focusing on these benefits that are maybe not material, but they're, they're really important benefits that can come from a, an ecosystem. So just the, the sheer beauty that comes from walking an environment with biodiversity. So and the, the species that are associated with cultures and, and the species that are associated with letting us learn about the world. Um, biology and medicine, these are all intertwined, physics and nature. And so you can learn about the world by getting inspired, seeing little organisms. So when you grow up around the world with biodiversity, you become excited about it, so excited about nature, and you wanna learn more about the world. So this is a little bit, what I want to kind of talk about today. We can kind of talk about some other ecosystem, ecosystem services as well. Um, but this idea of how can we promote these cultural benefits um, in our ecosystems. So I like to think about what makes a cultural re, culturally rewarding ecosystem is one where every day you have the opportunity to see something new. So 
there's no homogeneity. You just have the experience of some kind of new thing. Um, so if, if you think about what catches our attention, you go for a walk in the park, and if it's the same tree in rows and all you're seeing is that same tree, you can kind of get dull. Your senses just kind of slip away and you're seeing that repetitiveness. But what catches your attention? That one red bird that's sitting on the branch of the tree. So it's the new, it's the, it's the experience that kind of jumps out at you. This is from Bell University. This is our campus. This is the hillside that was um, designed by Benjamin Boat on our gardens. We got a grant from the Nebraska Statewide Arboretum to put this in just a few years ago. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we designed this plant community and, and what it accomplishes. But it's almost like a fractal where you're looking at why and you can see all of these little pieces and then you go in and you kind of see these same patterns over and over again. And the more you look, the more interesting things you find. One thing that I think most people can generally appreciate is the cultural value of a bird. We probably all grew up as kids, we saw birds and we can hear them in the spring. They, they just feel to, like an embodiment of the landscape. This is a paper that came out in 2019, Science, um, that is showing the massive decline in bird numbers since 1970. Um, and this is based on different categories of bird based on their habitat. Um, and you might notice that one that has taken perhaps the biggest hit that is, you know, it should be uh, very near and dear to our heart is the grasslands, which is, this would be the ecosystem of the grassland kind of occupying this large area in here. And these birds are very specialized for this grassland area. Um, and they're one of the most declining group of birds. One of the reasons for that is well, grasslands are also a really good area to grow crops. So we grow food in a lot of these areas as well. So we've broken up the grasslands into smaller and smaller habitats. And a lot of these grassland birds need massive habitats. So uh, this is an upland sandpiper. Um, it's not alone in its need for habitats of maybe greater than 100 acres in order to reproduce. So these kind of birds are probably not ones that we're going to really restore in lots like we see here in these kind of little patches. These are things that we're going to have to go out and restore wild natural prairie in order to, you know, improve the bird populations of grassland birds. But I'm going to point out a couple here that might be a little bit more inspiring. Um, if we can think about the possibilities as inspiring, not what's actually happening. But habitat generalists and boreal forest birds are also sharply declining. Well, habitat generalists are birds that can really occupy any areas. They don't need a 100 acre prairie in order to reproduce. So we have the possibility of impacting those birds. We can increase their proportions and improve our communities. You might be thinking, I don't have a boreal forest in my backyard, so how could I be improving the boreal forests? Well, the boreal forest birds are migrating through our area of North America in order to spend the spring, summer, in the boreal forests of Canada, and that's where they reproduce. So by having food for them on the way through, we are supporting those bird populations, and then we get to experience them as well. Um, so, you're thinking birds, birds, birds. Where's where's the points coming? What, what category would be uh, sandhill cranes fall under? <laughs> yeah, so I think they would be considered a wetland species. Yeah, um, which are are certainly wetlands are seeking the fate of prairies similarly um, for different reasons. Um, more so that. Well, prairies are an area that are very good for agriculture. Wetlands are areas that are very poor for agriculture, so poor for development, so we tend to drain them because um, you can't grow crops very well in wetlands. So what do birds need? Well, birds need plants. And you may not think of this immediately, 
Um, this is not like our direct food web that we often see birds nibbling on a leaf, but I'm going to explain to you something you might already know, but reintroduce you to the idea of why birds uh, eat plants, so to speak. So if you remember back to oh, this maybe elementary school when you first kind of talked about this concept, um, and sometimes these things you think about and you talk about, then they escape your mind and you never really think about them again. Hopefully we can kind of reintroduce the vigor for the excitement of these ideas. So it all starts with the sun, right? All really life on earth starts with the sun. And we're gonna give a little example here of a good plant in our area. This is the white oak where it's held on. Well, this white oak is gonna sit here and bask in the sun. And in doing that, it's going to suck up all of this carbon dioxide and it's going to use the energy from the sun to build this carbon dioxide into a more complicated molecule. And that's glucose. So C6H12O6. This is a, a sugar molecule, effectively. So it's all this is really doing. It's a series of biochemical reactions fueled by the energy of the sun. It's going to take that carbon dioxide and build a sugar molecule. The same sugar molecules that we eat. So this happens in all sorts of plants, right? If you're green, that means you're doing this. This is called photosynthesis, and you probably are aware. This is building these glucose molecules with the energy from the sun and the carbon from carbon dioxide. It doesn't matter what plant you are, you're doing this. Now, where do the birds come in? Of course, the birds can't eat these plants. They, if that was their food source, they're going to be looking confused at it. Um, this bird can't get any nutrition from that plant. And in really most cases, we can't get very much nutrition from just eating um, most plants too. It depends on the sort of like a crop that are actively storing a lot of glucose. Um, so where do those birds get their food? Well, some things can eat leaves. And something that does eat leaves really well is a caterpillar. And so what you get here is Caterpillars themselves also can't photosynthesize. They've missed out on this fun evolutionary trick. But what they can do is they can eat things that do photosynthesize, like plants. And they are very well adapted to do this. And so they can munch these leaves and steal their glucose. The thing is, is these plants worked very hard for their glucose, so to speak. They sat there and absorbed the sun. They worked very hard biochemically. So they don't want to be eaten because Every molecule of glucose that is eaten and taken away is energy that has been stolen from them. So what do they do is they evolve mechanisms over long periods of time to deter insect herbivory. Um, so these might be little hairs on the leaves that make it hard for insects to attach. These might be thick saps that gum up the mouth parts of an insect when they chew. Um, it could be direct poisons. So a lot of plants are poisonous to insects. Some of those poisons are also poisonous to humans. Um, we think of milkweed in particular has cardiac glycosides. They'll stop the heart of insects. Um, and if you eat enough milkweed, it will stop your heart too. Um, I do know people who eat milkweed. You gotta get it when it's young. So if you get the, the little ones, I'm not really advising this here, but <laughs> if, you, if you get the little ones, you can apparently saute them up like a like an asparagus shoot, but don't let them get too big on you. <laughs> or, or seek someone who knows what they're doing as your guide. Well, of course, we know that caterpillars exist, and because caterpillars exist, they had to have overcome this mechanism. If they hadn't overcome this mechanism, caterpillars would have gone extinct. And we do have caterpillars. So this is an arms race, right? So what we had here is we had caterpillars that were able to overcome these defense mechanisms. In fact, what did the monarch butterfly caterpillar do? It has a new heart. It's a completely different little heart protein from the other insects. So this cardiac glycoside doesn't bind to that protein in the heart the same way it does. In fact, there was a cool paper that came out a couple of years ago they took that protein and they cloned it into a fruit fly and then made that fruit fly able to eat the 
poisons from milkweed. So it's uh, mapped down to this one little mutation that allows them to eat milkweed. And if you've ever read the Dr. Seuss, the <laughs> Butter Battle book, um, we've got young kids, so we've read this. It's you know, one kind of a, an appropriate for this particular setting as well. This is a, a book about two groups of people. One butters their bread on the top, and the other one butters their bread on the bottom. And of course, because of these differences, which are obviously even reconcilable, they uh, go to war and they build increasingly large machines to fight with each other. And of course, as soon as the top butterers make a big machine, the bottom butterers have to make a bigger machine to prevent that. So this is what we'd call an arms race. This is like what we saw you know, in the Cold War with the Soviet Union. Well, this is the same thing that happens throughout evolutionary time. Caterpillars are, are evolving new mechanisms to overcome plant defenses. Plants are evolving new mechanisms to combat caterpillars. And what you get is a very tight linkage in between uh, plant and insect. Whereas any given plant is probably not going to be eaten by the majority of caterpillars. But the caterpillars that can eat that plant I've gotten fairly good at eating it. So what this means is we have a lot of caterpillars that have kind of specialized on a small group of plants that they can eat and a lot of plants that only allow a small group of caterpillars to eat them. This is really good for both parties because the plants don't get overwhelmed by caterpillars. They have some that can eat them, but because they're deterring most of the caterpillars, the plant doesn't lose all of its foliage and die. And it's pretty good for the caterpillars because when they specialize, they get really good at overcoming those defenses and they can get as much nutrients as possible from that plant. It's not easy. So because of that, they're still not killing the plant from eating it, but um, they're able to get enough to keep on keeping on. These are just a few examples of, of some that were on the plants we mentioned before. So, uh, the monarch is probably the most iconic because it's a very strong specialist of, of members of uh, this Asclepius genus, so the milkweeds, or in some senses, the other members of that family, like dogbane. Um, and some things have a looser relationship, but um, generally, most caterpillars eat plants from a couple families, not much more than that. And these if you're thinking about caterpillars, these gross, squishy things that eat my plants, these all, you know, undergo metamorphosis into wonderful butterflies. So you can't have one without the other. And so if we want to live in this culturally wonderful world filled with butterflies, we have to have a world full of caterpillars. Which if you ask, this biologist are beautiful in their own right, but maybe that may be an unpopular opinion. Well, how do we get back to birds? Well, birds need food and they can't eat plants like caterpillars can, but what they can eat is things that eat plants. And this is your classic, you know, food pyramid shelves that you probably remember seeing at some point in your education. And we often think of birds eating seeds or maybe berries because that might be what we observe them eating the most because we put out bird feeders and they come and they eat the seeds there. But the vast majority of North American birds are not eating seeds when they're raising their young, they're, they're eating insects. So baby birds are really bad at eating these complex starchy things. Uh, what they need to eat is a nice squishy insect that's rich in protein. And it's rich in all of these amino acids. So you might have heard about this from nutrition things that you have these essential amino acids that you can't make yourself. You have to get them from your food. If you're a vegetarian, you're probably very aware of that to eat special vegetables in order to make sure you get all those amino acids. Well, insects are really packed with the full gamut. So you can get all of your wonderful amino acids, which you need to be you go from a little bird to a big bird. And so that's one of the reasons why they use that. This is an old paper that gets highly referenced from the 1960s where 
you're looking at thousands of caterpillars to support one clutch of chickadees. Um, so when we're talking about if we want birds, what do we need? A lot of caterpillars. So when we're thinking about those, those migratory birds that are coming up and nesting in the boreal forest, well, a lot of those, um, they're spending their winters down in lovely Central America or maybe in the Northern parts of South America. And they're flying through pretty soon here. And, you know, in the next month, we're gonna see a lot of these. Um, what do they eat during the spring? They don't eat seeds they evolve to eat the things that are becoming really abundant in the spring and that's insects. Now they might have a seed rich diet when they're coming back in the fall, which is when you would have seeds, but when they're coming through in the spring, we're really looking for a protein rich insect diet. And I'll point out all of these birds here, um, which are probably not ones you see all that commonly, were all ones that were just in our backyard um, just because we have been pretty adamant about supporting insects for them. So um, if you have the plants that are around that the native insects can eat, you're gonna have more of these insects. And as a result, you're gonna have more birds. So this is a, a paper, if you've been following any um, native plant stuff, Recently, you've probably heard the name Dotalamy. His lab has really been working on quite a bit recently of how can we figure out the role of plants in supporting ecosystems and communities. So it, beyond just what ecology historically has really been focused on the wilderness out there. And here is where people live. We'll just kind of ignore that because it's not very interesting. And we'll study prairies or we'll study the Amazon rainforest or the savanna. But more recently, people are recognizing that humans are part of the ecosystem and we want to have interesting ecosystems where we live. So part of this research is seeing what proportion of native plants do we need in order to have enough insects to support native bird species. And this uses the example of chickadees, which have been well studied. And we know that they have a very insect rich diet, especially when they're raising their, their clutch. Um, and what they found is you need about 70% coverage on a typical suburban lot in order to support one clutch of chickadees. So 70% of your plants need to be indigenous. Otherwise, they don't support enough insects in order to allow that clutch of eggs to raise um, chicks till fledgling size. They will lay the eggs, but most of them won't survive because they were not getting enough food. If they go, that percentage gets low enough to say 20 or 30% native plants, the chickadees won't even lay their eggs because they know that it's gonna be not enough because they can presumably detect the insect abundance of an area, I don't know. Um, but as it's getting to 50-ish, 60-ish percent, they will make a nest, they'll lay the eggs, but the yield of those chickadees is pretty low. One of the things that I am most in tune with, um, that I get most excited about with habitat is the cultural benefit of insects. So even if you're not just thinking about insects as a means to the ends of birds, insects themselves are quite fascinating. And I spend a good amount of my time in the summer laying on my belly in the garden, just looking for weird stuff. And I'm always seeing weird things that I had not seen before. And then you get to spend the time in the evenings, you know, parsing through books, looking to identify what you saw. And then you can learn about the life history of this interesting creature that you never knew existed before. This is just a little bit of a smattering in that if we kind of take that idea of what makes a culturally rewarding ecosystem, well, it's one where the more you look, the more you find. Well, certainly if you have insects and if you've got um, plants that are springing up in new places and you've got things that eat these insects, maybe it's interesting spiders, maybe it's reptiles or amphibians, the more you look, the more you'll find. Okay, so how do we do this? What's the actual mechanism of creating habitat within cities? We 
we mostly all of us live in an area around people. So we want to try to figure out how can we create these culturally rewarding habitats where people are. We definitely need huge expansive prairies and large untapped forests, but we'll let somebody else worry about that. I'm not in charge of a huge prairie. I don't have access to a multi-acre forest, but we do have land that we are stewards of. So whether it's area here or in our yards or something like that, we can do quite a bit with that. So this native plant finder is on the National Wildlife Federation website. It's a really good tool that you can look up on here. And this is Doug Tallamy's group came up with this tool that you can put in your zip code and it provides you the plants that support the greatest number of Lepidopter species. So Lepidopter are moths and butterflies, which when they're larvae are caterpillars. So in our area, the ones that really support the most species are the Prunus genus, which this is our choke cherries, our black cherry, um, and the American plum are all in this genus. Um, the willows are really popular, so Salix species are like black willow, uh, peach leaf willow. Um, Oaks, the native oaks are a big supporter. In some areas, the native oaks are the major contributor. In ours, it's kind of down the list a little bit. Yeah, you've So what kind of willow do we have out here? Do you know? Hmm, I don't know. I would have to look. We have cottonwood and we have willows and we don't have oak. That's one of the trees I wanted to plant. Yeah, there, but, um, I would guess it's a black willow. It's not a weeping willow, is it? Rick? No, it's not a weeping. Yeah. So the, the weeping willows are, are not native to North America, um, and it would probably not come in on its own, which I think the willows down here just kind of showed up, right? Or, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mostly by the water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So most willows are, are a wetland tree. They can survive a lot of water. Um, probably the black willow, I would guess, in this area. I think we've maybe got three or four species that kind of in eastern Nebraska. So you have to look at a leaf to key them. Um, but yeah, so these, if, if you've lived in Nebraska your whole life, you probably consider most of these species as iconic plants. Uh, you probably recognize them from your childhood, especially if you grew up in a rural area, uh, you probably recognize, you know, choke cherries and, you know, wild plum and, Certainly cottonwoods, which anywhere where there's a little bit of water, they grow up and do well. Um, really, we the main oak of Nebraska is the bur oak. We don't really have a lot of oaks. Um, kind of on this eastern Missouri Valley, we've got a little bit more, but it gets a little, little dry for those other besides the bur oak to get further west. Those are all good insect producers. You might notice that woody plants are the, the most insect producers, so trees and shrubs, when you look up these databases. Um, but don't discount forbs and grasses, which do host a good number of caterpillar species, and they provide a lot of other ecosystem services as well. For in the fall, we're really looking at berries, um, especially you know early fall, late summer. So if you're looking for things to support birds, berries are good. Some non-native shrubs are actually poisonous to native birds. So um, the birds of our area co-evolved with these native shrubs. So this is an elderberry in this picture that our neighbors had and we take advantage of it because we get to watch birds eating out of it. Although it does put up about 250 little babies in our yard every year, but um, we either give those away to friends or you know, they put a lawnmower to them or something. Um, so some of these are relatively prolific plants, but you know, you could buy one plant and get the others for free. <laughs> um, so if you are looking to support moths and butterflies, which you know, we all should be because moths and butterflies are pretty cool, and because they are the things that are eaten by birds, which are also pretty cool, um, you need host plants, which you can find through that National Wildlife Federation database. But then you also need a few other things. We need plants for nectaring, 
Um, so the adults, which are the moth and the butterfly, they eat nectar. They don't eat leaves, so they need flowers. The flowers are usually less specific. Uh, so native flowers are, are better for bees in particular, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But moths and butterflies, they, they basically, their mouth is a big tube. And as long as they can fit their big tube down in there, they don't really care. So you've probably seen butterflies on non-native flowers. And they really don't mind for the most part. The only problem with those non-native flowers is the caterpillars can't eat their leaves. So those caterpillars have to be grown elsewhere. And so you'll see the adults come in, you know, on, I don't know, like a dahlia or something like that. You'll see the adult butterfly come in and get nectar and they will generally appreciate it. Some non-native flowers don't have the nutritional requirements because they've been bred for aesthetics and they don't have uh, the nutritional benefits of a native flower, but really for the most part, it's just that it's a plant that's not doing as much good as it could be if it were a native plant. Um, then you wanna have some spots for overwintering. So that means not clearing the whole ground. Um, so like right now, the weather's kind of nice. And so people are very tempted to mow everything, like all of your habitat down. But we have, this is where, um, either caterpillars or sometimes the butterflies themselves are overwintering. So we want to make sure to leave those spaces up. Now bees, people are a little scared of bees because they've got their sneers, but I tell you, and I'm, I said before, I spent most of the summer on my belly looking for things. I have not once been stung um, by bees or even wasps, and I, I get about an inch and a half away from their face. They don't, they don't bother me. And in fact, most of the bees in North America are solitary. In fact, really the only ones that are not solitary that are native are bumblebees. And the ones that most people think of as a bee in North America are the honeybees, which are really the most aggressive of the bees that you can encounter. They're not even one of our native bees. And the reason why they're aggressive is because they have a hive to defend. The rest bees, they live alone and their stinger is really a last resort. And if you've ever been stung by a little tiny bee, it's probably because you felt something crawling on you and you swatted at it. You probably literally smashed its stinger into you. And it, it wanted to do everything in its power to avoid stinging you because it's, it's not going to do anything. So it knows it's not going to deter you with that little tiny stinger. So it's going to try to avoid it. Um, if you want to support those, and I just want to point out with these photos here that we have a bunch of different bees. And if you haven't spent time looking at the diversity of bees, there's some really cool bees. Just go out here and find a good flower, lay on your belly when summer comes and people are gonna look at you weird, but you're gonna have a good time and that's what matters. <laughs> there's little tiny bees. So these are anthers from a rattlesnake master. So this is a, a little tiny bee. This is smaller than a grain of rice. Mm -hmm. This is on some goldenrod. It's a little helictus bee, Lassio blossom. Uh, there's just a ton of variety. These are a little bit bigger. So these Melissa Yodi's bees, um, these are, you know, maybe bumblebee sized bees. And all of these bees, they absolutely need continuous flowers during their whole life cycle. Some of these bees will only live for a week or two. Those ones that only live for a week or two might be very specialized on a particular flower that only blooms during that week or two. So if you have those species of native flower, you could attract and support those particular unique species of native bee. Some species, like this Lassio blossom here, you've probably seen them. They're these little tiny black bees. You might've thought they were a gnat or something. Um, they have a long, uh, life cycle. So they're, they're active during most of the spring and summer, well into fall. And so they're generalists. So they will go to just about any flower that they can get access to. Because of that, they're very good pollinators for crops because they're in huge numbers and they can do really uh, good pollinating things. So another way we can support our good insect populations is to limit our pesticide and instead try to support beneficial insects. So these again are some images just from our backyard of some cool species that will just come on their own. You don't have to buy them from a catalog. If you just create habitat, they're going to come and you get to watch these alien-esque sci-fi encounters. <laughs> this is a lacewing larvae. These are aphids. 
Those are also aphids down there. And they will come and they'll just go one right after the other. You can watch them just smash these aphids and suck their juices out. We'll go to the next one, smash the aphids, suck their juices out. Uh, and you can buy, oh, this is a, a surfeit fly larva over here, which does the same. So this, what some people might think of as a slightly grotesque creature, although it's quite lovely in its own right. It likes to pick them up and almost shake them like a T-Rex and then it sucks their goo out. And these are all the dead ones that are left behind in this image. Um, so it can go through them pretty quickly. The nice thing about the surfeit flies is they hatch into these lovely flower flies. So the flower flies, hover flies, um, it's in the family surfidae that you've probably seen these around. These are lace wings and they uh, hatch out into these lace winged adults. You can buy lace wings, you can buy ladybugs on the internet and have them come. But those are mass produced. They often have diseases. And oftentimes with the ladybugs, they're an invasive species of ladybug that you're introducing anyway. So you might as well just leave some habitat. These things can do really well. Every year we get an explosion of these oleander aphids on our milkweed. They come up and then by about mid-June, they're gone. They just disappear. Things eat them. Here's some other wonderful little beneficial insects that we've had around our yard. So uh, this is a long-legged fly. And it's got a big mouthful of wonderful goo. Of course, dragonflies and damselflies or mosquito eaters. This is an assassin bug. Um, yeah, we're having ID contests right there. Yeah. So it's an assassin bug, sometimes called a wheel bug because of that little arch on the back, yeah. Um, I have seen these stab through a Japanese beetle and suck their goo out. They're one of the Yay, few things that will be Japanese beetles. Um, wasps are wonderful pest controllers. Most of them lay their eggs on their host and they paralyze them when they sting them. That's what the wasp stinger is really for. They drag them back and then, you know, they, they let their larvae eat the thing alive. So. Uh, we actually had a student a couple years ago, and, and she was new to outdoor research and stuff, and she was working and having a good time, and this little spider was coming down, and she was a little nervous at first, and then she, she was getting, oh, she's appreciative of this little spider, and then a wasp came down and just drilled the spider, <laughs> knocked it to the ground, and started belt, pelting it with this stinger right in front, and then she started screaming, and, <laughs> and then so it laid a bunch of eggs on the spider, and then we watched it take it back to the nest, and we looked inside the nest, and it's just hundreds of paralyzed spiders in this nest, and if you ever see these little nests, that's what they do, is they paralyze their spiders, take them back, and they lay their eggs on them, and while the spider's still alive, the larva hatch eat the spider. They do the same thing to all these grasshoppers, uh, beetles, there's wasps that will do the same thing for grasshoppers. Um, and some will even target Japanese beetles, even though they're non-native. Yeah. yeah. Um, I seem to get a wasp nest every year somewhere yeah. around my deck or in a corner. And I take a broom and get it down because I'm afraid that it's going to sting somebody. Yeah. What, what do you recommend? <laughs> so if you have that, it's probably a paper wasp. Um, possible it's probably a paper wasp which what i would do if it's me i would try not to do any sudden <laughs> movements around it and just live in harmony <laughs> now so what i say about wasps <laughs> most most wasps are very peaceful because they're solitary just like bees most wasps don't have colonies paper wasps do have colonies and so they will defend them they're not really that aggressive though, the paper wasp, unless you start poking the nest. Now I will say we dealt with last summer because we have our hillside, we're doing a bunch of research on it. There was, we had a rodent hole about, you know, eight inches in diameter and it got colonized by yellow jackets. Mm -hmm. Now yellow jackets are not peaceful at all. And <laughs> if you get 10 feet from their nest, they will come out and sting you. And I saw on YouTube, somebody, in a bee suit, dug the nest out, and I decided I wanted to be a hero. And so I got a, a bee suit off Amazon for $20, which I do not recommend. <laughs> and all of my colleagues were filming me as I went up with a shovel and my $20 bee suit to dig this 
this nest out. Um, and long story short, it didn't work. Uh, I got swarmed with thousands of these um, and they're just covering my bee suit. And I, I got like two scoops, um, but so yellow jackets, I would say do not allow them anywhere near because they are very territorial. Um, but I would, I would be okay letting a paper wasp hang out. Um, so. And I think you can get canceled. I don't know why that. I'm just, I can't get over to that. Yeah. No, the cancel button yeah. on the lower right there. Oh, I do. Okay. I couldn't get my cursor over there. I create. Oh, no. I'm not sure why that's got it. Up. I'm so, I don't know what that is. I don't know. We're all right. What are the wasps that live in the ground? So that, so that would be a yellow jacket that, that live in the ground. Um, and again, oh, they're pretty nasty. But a lot of things that live in the ground that people think are ground wasps or ground bees, mm -hmm. those are pretty peaceful. So those are a lot of those are solitary bees. Now, I will say for like an area out here, yellow jackets would be great because as long as you you don't have them within eh, ten feet from a path or something, yellow jackets are great pest control. Because those things are, they're very aggressive. They'll take down caterpillars and yeah. What is the name of the insect that eats the Japanese beetles? So this is an assassin bug or, or a wheel bug. Yeah, we've had them out in the garden. Yeah. yeah. So they, uh, assassin. assassin bug, yeah. So they're a hemipterin, it's like a true bug. Um, they are kind of the top of the food chain when it comes to insects. They're a little intimidating. So I've heard people who try to catch them with their bare hands, they will stab you with that proboscis and I've heard it hurts. So this, this right here is that proboscis um, and it'll, it'll go pretty deep. So I, I've never had a problem with it, but when you do get close and you're watching them, they, they make a loud noise when they fly away. And it is a little scary. I mean, even for me, I'm an insect lover, but you just see that proboscis and if you've seen them stab through a carapace of a beetle, you know that it can go pretty deep in your skin. So. To find the cursor at the end of it for me. Besides um, assassin bugs, um, are there any other bugs that you know that eat Japanese beetles? Yeah, so there's, uh, and I don't remember the, the genus off the top of my head, but there's a wasp that targets, it's a parasitoid wasp that targets ground beetles, and it has been shown that it will lay eggs on Japanese beetles as well. Mm. So it, um, it, they dig in the ground actually, so they dig underneath and they catch them as larvae and they lay their eggs on them as larvae. Oh, nice. Yeah. So uh, I just want to kind of, you know, talk a little about how could you create these communities um, this is a, if you're interested in this, this is a really good book. It's called Planting in the Post-Wild World. And it's really about designing plant communities um, for functionality, not just in terms of supporting insects, but also in terms of low maintenance, because everything's kind of occupying a niche. So you kind of have the structural layer, and then you've got these seasonal theme layers, so things that are popping up at different points in time. And then what is often avoided in traditional landscaping is this ground cover layer. People put in this, this layer of mulch and that's does a pretty good job of holding out weeds for a season maybe, but it's really not accomplishing that much in terms of ecosystem functions. And it really doesn't support you know, weed prevention in the long term. So instead, if you could get a native grass or a matrix of native sedges in here, um, that can do that quite a bit better. So this is our site that we had on campus. So this is right before we were about to plant. So we had the, this hill was, so a few months before, it was basically this giant weed patch. Um, and so that's kind of why we got permission to turn it into a native hillside. Well, of course, right the day we were gonna plant, we had a monsoon. And so we got this mudslide that came down the hill and all our donors were there and we had this <laughs> fancy ribbon cutting and 
while they're doing the fancy ribbon cutting, I'm in my muck boots, just slopping through the mud, planting things. And so um, that was a bit of a mess. Um, this is what it looked like a week before planting day. And just to see what that mud slide looked like. Um, but this is what our time zero is when we took a lot of samples from this and stuff. And just to give you a little bit of kind of an anatomy of this site, um, this is kind of our, our structural layer. We were lucky to have this wonderful Baroque that was already there. Um, we, it's, that's not a three-year-old Baroque. Um, and we planted a Kentucky coffee tree over there as well. Uh, and then this is kind of the hillside right now. And it is a matrix of a, a bunch of forbs planted as plugs with Butalua critipendula from seed. So this is Cytos grandma. Um, and what this is, is that ground layer, ground cover layer that is, you know, blocking the weeds, but it's also caterpillars eat Butalua. So this is also supporting more moth species, um, skippers, those wonderful little triangular shaped butterflies that are kind of look like a moth. They're eating Butalua as well. And so we have, this is a large space. So this is a mix between species that are going to be really long lived and stable and hold their ground. And some that are really prolific seeders that are gonna throw seed around and spread. What we want here is we want these plants to fill in over time and not have weeds do it. Yeah. Did you bring in any new soil or compost or did you- We, well- On top of the clay. We brought in new soil because we needed to grade it. And if you, this was in 2019 when we had the floods. Mm -hmm. If you remember those, I'm sure everyone around here remembers those floods, but our native hillside project is important. It was, was not the most important use of soil at the time. So it was very hard to get soil. What we got was uh, basically fill dirt that was gravel and you know, it, like partially degraded wood chips mm -hmm. that we spread. And it's not what you would call good soil. Um, now, Ben, uh, Benjamin Vogt, who helped us design all this, he's a big advocate of using the native soil in the area, the clay. We just needed to add soil to grade it. But the benefit of using those native soils that are right in that area is you pick plants that are adapted to those soils and they're gonna outcompete the other things that are coming in. So that's kind of the goal. If you put like compost on top, you do run the risk of weeds that thrive in those high nutrient soils. And I don't know if you're very familiar with the, the idea of ecological succession. So this is that if an area gets cleared, then it just kind of reestablishes itself. And this is kind of what you're doing when you're planting a plant community. You are disturbing the area, you're clearing out the previous plants. And what you wanna do is design a community that is allowed to progress over time through these successional stages. So early on, you have these early successional flowers, these ruderal species that come up quickly and they flower quickly and they put out seeds quickly. And these might eventually give way to some later species, but that's okay. Things like Baptisia and maybe grasses that will come in later. In our area, these might later, if there's no disturbance, kind of give way to oak and sumac and some other shrubs. And at any point in time, if you want to knock it back here, just do a little disturbance. So um, that could be a burn. If you've got space for a burn, it could be a, we may not want to do a burn here, I don't know. <laughs> um, it could be um, like a real vigorous mow, like a very short mow and pull the thatch up. You know, you could bring some cows in or something, some bison. <laughs> the bison or what would have done it um, naturally. What we do is we have our Irish wolfhound run around the backyard and she <laughs> digs up holes and that does it. So this is where we're at right now. We've got all of, this is last summer. These are all fairly early successional species that we have here. So Rebecca herta, which is a biennial, uh, Dracopsis and Plexicolis, this is an annual species. Uh, Echinacea polita is a, um, this is a perennial, but it blooms pretty early. Coreopsis tinctoria is one of the annual native Coreopsis. And as you can see, this is a hillside right now that's still fairly dominated by annual species. The perennials haven't come in. This is 
really year three, they're there, they're just not blooming. So if we look at, I, we can only, I only don't need to show that much data, but I do have it if anyone wants to, but uh, I do love a good graph. <laughs> this is our vegetation volumes that we've been mapping over time. Actually, sorry, this is the blooming flower volumes that we've been mapping uh, just from starting this last season. So if you look really early on, we have basically one thing blooming in April, and that's Zizia aria, Golden Alexander. And you see, as you move into the season, you get more diversity of blooming flowers. Um, and this coincides with when we see the most diversity of insects as well. Now, what I think is a more interesting graph, even too, <laughs> just because it's, it's a little chaotic, but um, mostly because I, I kind of learned how to do some of the programming stuff in order to do this when I first had to send it all to my colleagues and look at my graph. Um, so what you see here is these are the relative proportions of each of these plant species from just the vegetative mass starting in March 2020, which is the first March after we planted in the fall, over to last May when our efforts were kind of shut off by a very angry yellow jagged nest that was in the middle of the summer. So um, what you can see is really early on, our main vegetation was, this is Carex vulpinoidea. But as we go over time, things are getting really even. There's not one species that's kind of dominating out. And what we're really expecting to see over time is this is to be very dynamic. So we're going to have some species are, you know, becoming more abundant, and then others are kind of falling into the background. And as we have a disturbance or a die off, maybe a drought causes some plants to die, some of these early successional species are going to pop back up again. So, and that's going to be perfectly fine. Um, yeah, and I don't need to go through all my other data here, but yeah. Just for the sake of time, we will skip over it. But if you have any data questions, I'm happy to, you know. This is, um, we've been tracking the insect abundance. So um, we just started doing this last year. We are starting to really get a peak in June, which makes sense. This is when we have the most flower diversity. It's also just the most um, pleasant weather for an insect, nice and warm and hot. Um, one thing that's kind of a notice the um, hymenoptera, which is the, the bees and the wasps, are fairly stable over time. They don't fluctuate as wildly as some of our other categories of insects. This is the hemiptera, the true bugs. Um, we've also been, this is kind of a little hot off the press stuff. Uh, we've been kind of using the Ptolemy database to try to theoretically map how many caterpillars we could be supporting at any given time based on the amount of plant volume necessary to support one single caterpillar. And then taking that and the number of caterpillar species supported by that individual species, we're getting an aggregate over time of the number of caterpillars and the, the magnitude of caterpillars that we're able to support in our area. Uh, we've got it to 187 unique species of caterpillar that we can theoretically computationally support, but we're going to see if we can, I, I'm assuming we're not hitting that number in reality, so I'm kind of curious what we're really hitting, because not a lot of people have been looking at these actual numbers, so, but we can see again is, so as we're going over time, you're kind of seeing evenness, there, you don't have any one plant that's dominating the caterpillar production. Um, I don't want to go too long, <laughs> um, but the other kind of thing that we've been doing here and a little bit on campus is dealing with microbes. So if you think plants are fundamental to an ecosystem, the more fundamental thing even so is bacteria and fungi in the soil. Um, and not to, I don't want to dwell on any of this, but these are multi-dimensional ordination plots. So it's basically you take all of the species of that area and in all of the dimensions and you squish it down into the two dimensions of this plot, just so we can see how things are different. So this is what I take on my ecology students that math is important for outside <laughs> biology too. Um, but basically what we saw is a lot of stuff was different in year zero that we took before that massive flood 
But since then, we haven't really seen much of a change in the microbial community. It's basically been the same. So we probably had a community in that original soil that we brought in. We had a big flood before we planted that washed everything out and it really skewed our microbial community. We added plants which stabilized the bank. And since then, it doesn't matter year one, year two, it's been basically the same bacteria. So we'll see what it looks like over time if it's gonna shift, but it kind of seems like the big event was just getting the hill stabilized. It wasn't necessarily the plants themselves, but we're gonna do more sophisticated analyses. I know you probably heard from John, he talked about your site here, because um, he had this paper that just came out about a year ago of the bacterial communities. We're doing some more sampling the bacterial communities here, seeing how they're changing over time. I, just to, I think this is kind of an interesting map. This is the, if you look on the wetland database map, um, it shows the wetlands for this area, but it shows one of them is in the middle of this interstate, this, <laughs> this highway. So um, clearly that pond got moved um, since 1981. We've done these ordination maps for this site as well. Um, so this is down here, this is the creek and the pond. Um, and so you can see all of these. So each four, if I remember right, is the, that is the creek portion. This is Hell Creek. So the creek is pretty stable in its bacterial community, but the pond is very dynamic. So um, you can see sometimes, and this is in October, the pond has a bacterial community that's very similar to that of the creek, but other times it's very divergent. So we haven't really figured out what all that is yet, but um, we're gonna do another year or two of sampling and see what we get. And we, we could talk for a long time on this, but it's not super interesting to a general audience. I don't, I don't know, maybe I'm misreading the room. I don't know. <laughs> um, but um, just as a conclusion that try to design a plant community uh, more than just a native garden or a pollinator garden, try to design a community and that way it's accomplishing all of these functions. It's dynamic over time. Don't worry about it being static. Plants are dynamic, ecosystems are dynamic. Um, the microbial community is probably gonna be dynamic. The plants are gonna be dynamic and such the insects are gonna be dynamic and get the cultural benefit of the insects. And if you want any more information, this is our Bellevue University Science, Science, uh, Science Center at Bellevue.edu. We, we put up little updates about papers we put out or research we're doing or something like that. Um, if you wanna see any like native plant things from me or look at more photos or anything, uh, we've got my site is Nature Among Us. These are people and organizations that I've worked with that are really helpful. Monarch Gardens, that's Benjamin Boat, who I think some of you have heard from. Um, he's been really valuable for designing native plant communities uh, for landscapes. Midwest Native Nurseries is really one of the best uh, native nurseries around here. So if you're just trying to get plants for your yard or something like that, they're out of Lincoln, but they deliver up to Omaha. Prairie Legacy, especially if you're looking for seeds because they have a lot of locally collected seeds. I know Midwest Natives uses a lot of their seeds to grow the plants, but they have plants as well. And uh, they're out of Western the town, not the location, so Western Nebraska. Um, Green Bellevue, I'm on the board, and we have a lot of pollinator projects, native habitat projects food insecurity projects. I'm sure we could probably work together on some of those here. Bellevue Native Plant Society, we're also um, trying to create more habitat around town. Then it's not, again, not just for the insects and for the birds and for the benefit of them, it's for the benefit of us because just world is more interesting when you can walk around seeing fun new things. So yeah, I know I um, we answered some questions and I got a little fast there at the end because I felt like kind of droning on a bit, but does anyone have any uh, other questions? <laughs> so what kind of uh, maintenance do you need like in your garden there to keep it at that point in the succession? Yeah, so if you want to keep it early successional, you can prevent things from spreading that are, so if you're thinking of like a 
really long lived um, placeholder plant that is going to over time take over, you can manually prevent those from doing so. And I think of like rhizomatous species that um, that might take over an area and choke out short lived plants. You can physically prevent them from doing so. Um, depends on how much work you want to put into it. So like you can design the plant community so that you don't have species that are going to take over over time, which is maybe a, a way to do it. But yeah, you have to have everything in real perfect balance for that to happen. But some things like, I don't know, some of the more aggressive goldenrods, for instance, they're, they spread by rhizomes and they can really like uh, ironweed and things like that. Um, they're just going to form a patch. So that patch will keep growing because not much is going to compete with it if the conditions are good. But if you want to limit it, then knock it back. Otherwise, just choose well and see what happens. I think we're also talking like, you know, six, seven years, eight years. If you look at like, so uh, Benjamin's house in Lincoln, he's very grass heavy now. He's had it up for over a decade. And a lot of those long lived grass species have dominated a lot of the, the uh, forbs, the flowering plants. What he does is he keeps trying to knock back the grasses. So like mow them short in the times when they're most active sometimes and keep adding more plugs of, of, of flowering forbs in. Earlier on in your planting, you're probably thinking, I want my grasses to take off because they're really good at keeping the weeds down. But then once they do, they, they'll keep the, the native flowers down a little bit too. If you were to go to um, some of these lakes around Omaha, I think of like Chalco, there are these areas that were designed as, as native plant restoration areas. One of them I can think of is just a big old field of Indian grass monoculture. It's the only plant there. I'm sure they seeded it as a diverse prairie mix maybe 20 years ago, but now it is Indian grass. It's the only thing. So there are some species that if you want to maintain a diverse community, especially in a smaller space, you might want to avoid. And certainly the tall grasses are maybe those. Indian grass, big blue stem, switchgrass. Yeah. Yeah. Question. The, the pond that we have here on the commons has, um, since we've, I've been paying attention, I guess, um, the cattails have started to really take over that whole pond. Yeah. And um, before we do anything or want to do anything, I don't know. I know it's a good filter, but it, is there a point where it's not a good filter anymore and it's just more like a chokehold on the area? Well, <laughs> yeah, cattails will do that. <laughs> um, so I think we were thinking about this on canvas as well. So we've got a pond that has been having algae problems and we're trying to create a system that is a sustainable system for making it not be an algae problem. So we, cattails were one thing we we're thinking about and then we decide- I've got some for you. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah. So, and that you have to decide how much of this pond do I want to be cattails and then as soon as it crosses over that, then you're gonna have to go swimming and you dig them out because they will they will go, as long as it's not too deep, they will keep going until right. it's nothing but cattails. So how do you factor that? How do, how do, what's the percentage? Where's the tipping point? And then there's that, uh, what's that duckweed that just covers the whole, whole yeah. place. So when we walk out there, I say to the kids, you can see where the frogs have been because you can see their little little puppy bowls that they yeah through so if there's resources available something will use it so if it's nitrogen and phosphate which i'm sure is coming in at a pretty high clip because it's that this mm -hmm. creek is hell creek is going through neighborhood after neighborhood or there's a lot of fertilizer mm -hmm. being applied on lawns yeah. and that's all converging in this this little pond here so things are going to use those nitrogen, um, those nitrates, phosphates. So you could cut back cattails and you're going to get 
more duckweed. Yes. You could you could cut back the cattails and try to clear out all the duckweed, and then you're going to get more algae. <laughs> so uh, something is going to grow there. So if there's excess nitrate, phosphates, and sunlight, something is going to use it. So it's kind of about choosing what you want to use that, I guess. So uh, do you want it to be all cattails and no pond? Eh, probably not, right? You probably want, so what you could try to do is start introducing maybe more native aquatic plants in there, because then you can think, well, this is something that will use that sunlight, will use those nutrients, and I want it there. It's like native arrowhead. You could try to put in like native lotus. Lotus is pretty vigorous, and so, um, it's pretty. Yeah, and it puts a flower out. And I think most people would enjoy seeing lotus or a, or a water lily over duckweed. <laughs> oh no, duckweed's a good plant. Yeah. Um, well, it's, you know, we want to, we, uh, since we've been out here, there's been construction across from us. And there was styrofoam, and there still is um, metal and plastic out there that we've tried to mitigate, but it's difficult out in water. Um, and then there's no place for the, the, turtles to you know rest so you know we getting that all kind of balanced before we do anything i think we need to think it all through before we start dinking around with stuff that's obviously the frogs and the the turtles and the fishes are there already you don't want to kill anybody yeah and you the tough thing is you can only do so much on your property because you're still going to be the product of what's happening upstream and i would always say you want to slow water draining into your pond because that is going to prevent runoff and reduce how much stuff is coming in what you could do well i was going to say you could try to create like a really dense wetlandy area before the pond to try to suck that area up this is a, a flood control wetland area you might, might want to check with the army corps before doing too much weird stuff yeah i was going to ask because it's <laughs> yeah. wetlands isn't there yeah rules and yeah so i'm not an attorney. <laughs> so I am pretty sure that the Army Corps is going to own all of this area and that you're going to not want to, they're kind of powerful. You don't want to do anything that's in violation with them. There's some laws in the books with like no net loss of wetlands, but this is a, a reconstructed wetland so I'm not sure how that applies and that's not like a native wetland area. Oh yeah I, yeah. I was gonna say yeah we've had this question before about the Army Corps of Engineers uh -huh. and I know that with the creation of the Tri-State Commons uh, an agreement was entered into where like they would kind of manage and monitor for a certain amount of years we were limited in what we could do, but I want to say that that actually ends relatively soon. I think it's either this year or next year, so I'm not sure like what would happen after that or what the process is, if we would have more control over it. Um, probably need to like talk to some of the people who were originally involved in getting the land and the site and work with all of the parties to figure that stuff out. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. But you can think about this, this pond, it's, think of it as a noble act of taking the bullet of all of that fertilizer runoff. So you may not have this crystal clear, you know, swimming pond of sorts, but you are sucking up a lot of nasty stuff before it drains into the Missouri and then into the Gulf of Mexico. So you can feel noble when you see that duck <laughs> rolling up. That's, that is just, you, and you can, you can harvest that and eat it. Do you know what the nitrates are in that pond? In this pond, I don't. Um, did he analyze it? I, well, I know that we did a quick rudimentary test and it was off all of the charts that we had, which is not that surprising. <laughs> um, well, the one thing would be to go upstream and see if there's some sources that are to be controlled. Because, like, yeah. Boys Town is up there, and if they have land that doesn't have any buffer or something, you might be able to work with them. Yeah, it's it's possible. It, so it's it's the pond in Boys Town and everything in between. And so our flood mitigation strategy is usually get everything into the street as quick as possible and then into the canals as quick as possible and then into the river as quick as possible. 
um, and then just accepting that the river is going to flood. What that does is it, it basically every lawn from in between Boys Town and here is just going to flood right into the street and then go right into these these drainage areas and um, not to be too nihilistic about it, but it's it. I think reducing the nitrate levels in this pond would probably that might be a, an uphill battle that is, you're not getting that much reward out of. And maybe it's just, you know, like I said, just be proud that you are the sink. <laughs> um, maybe someone else would have a different opinion on that, but you know that every molecule of phosphate that's going into here and then getting sucked up by some duckweed or some cattails is not going into the ocean. So just think of it that way. But a lot of that and that gets into these streams is that goes on lawns is actually missing the lawn. It's going right. in the street or on the driveway. And so if people know to tell their applicators, you know, hey, we're watching, we don't want that there. That's the stuff that really is important to stop. Yeah, or just get rid of your lawn altogether. Yes, yeah. do that. And just make a lovely <laughs> fertilizer-free native area. Or if nothing else, um, try to think about um, grass species that don't need fertilizer. So there are fertilizing, or at least some that have very highly reduced. I know we don't fertilize our front yard. Our front yard is at least half lawn. Um, so we just use a bunch of fescue varieties that are very slow growing. And if they're very slow growing, they're slow nutrient using. Um, Prairie Moon Nursery has a, a mix that they call Nomo lawn. It's not because you don't have to mow it, but it's it grows so slowly you could either let it kind of flop over, which you know people don't always like, but in the backyard it would probably be fine. But it we mow ours maybe three times a year or something during the growing season. You can go two or three weeks without mowing it, and we don't fertilize it, um, we don't water it. So and it stays pretty green. Um, so I think those things could help. You can't control everyone's actions in between here and there. But. Oh, darn. <laughs> yeah. we, we could start a campaign that everyone from Boys Town this way have a homegrown national park in their backyard. Yes. Let's do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, I like to, I like the carrot over the stick, you know, and try to, you know, people like to have their autonomy. So as soon as you start telling people what to do, they mm -hmm. like to do the opposite. Yeah. Um, but whenever you like to give people an idea of, oh, here's something you can do out of your own choice. And, you know, just like if you have a spouse and they've ever manipulated you into doing something. So it's kind of like that. <laughs> <laughs> you want to tell tell us more. Yeah, I hope, I hope my wife's not listening. <laughs> I, I do know that we have, I think, five or six people who, uh, are participating through Zoom, so thank you for that. Sorry for any technical issues. I can see that there's some things in the chat, but I can't get to oh. it. So, oh, that was Eileen. Okay. Yeah, this is Eileen's bailiwick, isn't it? Oh, okay. There we go. I was going to ask if anybody had any questions. Oh, there we go. Um, does anybody on the Zoom have any questions? No, but thank you. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that everyone's interested in, in this topic. And um, yeah, I hope we can we can do more here and um, maybe gather around more people who have some more expertise and, and you know put our minds together. I I think everything starts with admission and that everyone wants to do good things here, which is nice. So then you just got to figure out what the good thing is to do. But that's a that's a better problem to have than other potential problems. So it's not like you all want to do evil things. And so that's good. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. You are a great teacher. Yes. Oh my gosh. I'm